right. Well, welcome. We begin now our series in 1 Corinthians, and boy, what a series it's going to be. So hear now the word of the Lord to you and to me. I'll be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Jesus Christ. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of, the God, the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, Corinthians. So as I was studying for our series, as I was preparing for today, I learned a lot of new things, right? I also learned that Corinthian can be used to describe somebody, right? So a Corinthian, maybe you knew this, is a, is a kind of a playboy type, a person devoted to the pursuit of pleasure. Think of Corinthian columns, if you're somewhat familiar with uh, ancient architecture. Corinthian columns, they're the most ornate columns in ancient architecture. To call someone a Corinthian could also be used to describe a person who has given themselves in to every desire. Now I got your attention, right? Corinth, a port city. A place to be seen, a place to be known, a place to rise through the social ranks and make it. And if you lived in Corinth in Paul's day, you'd be a resident of a bustling port city in Greece. Commerce and people from all over the world would converge here in Corinth to trade, to learn, and to up their public status at any cost. And if you could make it in Corinth, it didn't matter how you made it or who you had to stomp on, on the way to the top, if you could do that in Corinth, you could do it anywhere. Corinth is a bustling metropolis that had the best and worst that a city could offer its inhabitants. In Corinth, you had social mobility. You really could rise up the ranks there. You had immense wealth. You had all kinds of opportunities for education. It was a major trade hub. It was a melting pot of cultures and religions. And one thing about Corinth is you could have it all there for better or worse. The city had abject poverty, right next to great wealth. It was full of haves and have-nots, those who do the cheating and those who get cheated, hustlers, suckers, every pleasure imaginable at the time. Now, check this out. Even by pagan standards, Corinth was known for its moral corruption. Exactly where the church needed to be. So the question they're, that they're wondering, and, and the question that we are going to process and come back to time and again, is how does a community live a godly life in an ungodly world? That's the sermon topic. That's the series topic. Living a godly life in an ungodly world. And that's what Paul's letter to the church in Corinth deals with. If you read Acts 18, Acts 18 gives us a little bit of background on uh, the Corinthian situation here. So Paul spent 18 months preaching the gospel, and with the help of Priscilla and Aquila, he planted a church in one of the most ungodly and influential urban areas of the time, right there in Corinth. After Corinth, Paul went to Ephesus for three years, and during his time in Ephesus, Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthian church. But there's a problem. We don't have that letter. It got lost somewhere. So, Paul's first letter is lost. 1 Corinthians, as we actually know it in our Bible, is actually Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, right? And he mentions the first letter in chapter 5, and the content dealt with sexual immorality. So the letter we have is 1 Corinthians was written after an oral report 
about the church in Corinth because it seems that they didn't quite understand what Paul was writing in his first letter that has been lost. So now we're dealing with a host of other issues within the church. Picture this. Imagine these things happening in a church, if you will. Just be open to this, right? Imagine the church dealing with division. Sexual immorality in the church. Snobbery, even. So after the oral report Paul received, he then got a letter from the church in Corinth about all kinds of questions. You see, Paul, we're living in Corinth, and we used to do these things, but now because the grace of Jesus Christ has touched us, we're, we know we have to live differently, but how do we do that? How do we live as disciples in an area where there are no other disciples? How do we live godly lives in an ungodly world? What does marriage look like, Paul? What does divorce look like? Can we eat food that's been sacrificed to idols? What do we do in worship? What does our order of worship look like? What about the bodily resurrection? What does that mean for us? And that's how 1 Corinthians, as we know it, came to be. And I'll tell you, it's a letter, right? So we're going to spend some time beginning now. We're going to go all the way up to Advent in 1 Corinthians. And the way we do things here at Little Church on the Prairie and Lake with Grace, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You know why? Because there's a lot of uncomfortable things in here that we would rather not preach on. But if we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, they're all there. We can't avoid them. So you're going to hear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a preview. Check this out. You're going to hear awesome sermons in this series. You're going to hear amazing sermons. You're going to hear hard sermons, hard to preach, hard to hear. Because this church struggled with remembering what God had done. Because they forgot what God had done, they struggled with knowing who they were. And when we forget those things, we lose sight of hope. Listen to what this church struggled with, and this is all in the text. This church struggled with divisions within the church. And these different divisions led to quarreling and jealousy in the church. I know this is shocking to you, right? Arrogance in the church, right? Keep in mind, these are Washington, these are Corinthians. (laughs) Prideful people addicted to power, prestige, and attaining wealth and satisfying every desire. There was a flamboyance about uh, Corinth. People couldn't surrender to the wisdom of the cross. People held on to that earthly wisdom, and they're trying to work it out, right? Sexual immorality in the church and the church's tolerance of that sexual immorality in the church. Lawsuits among believers, more sexual immorality, sex and marriage, marriage and celibacy, sex and celibacy. What do we do here, Paul? Social status in the church. You see, outside of the church, rich people and poor people, they have nothing to do with one another. Jews and Gentiles stay apart, but now they're united in Christ. So how do we worship together when outside we live two different worlds? How do we do that? Paul addresses that. The issue of causing others to sin is addressed. Idolatry is addressed. Rich people dishonoring poor people in worship. People getting drunk at communion. How are we to worship together, rich and poor, male and female? Are we using our spiritual gifts correctly? And what about the resurrection, Paul? So Jesus was raised not just spiritually, bodily. And in the, and in the Greek view, the Hellenistic way of things, the body was the low point, right? So you're telling me that Jesus was raised bodily and we will be too? This is an issue that the church was struggling with. So this sermon series, it's going to be good. And it's going to be so difficult. And we look at the Corinthian church and what they were dealing with, and these folks are a wreck. So if I'm searching, I'm not, but if I'm searching for a pastoral call and I receive a letter from these guys saying, hey, we want you to come over here, you know what I'm saying? No way. You all are yucky. I don't care how cool the city is. I don't care what the compensation package is. This is one dysfunctional church, and I'm going to take my chances with Lakewood Grace. 
Here's another perspective. And I think this is important to mention. Here's another perspective about Corinth. When Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, he was living in Corinth at the time. So while living in Corinth, writing to the church in Rome, Paul talks about people who exchange the truth about God for a lie. Paul talks about people who have abandoned natural sexual relations for unnatural sexual relations. He talks about people with depraved minds who do what ought not be done. Romans 1.29, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. He's in Corinth writing this. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. All Paul had to do to see the depths of human depravity was walk from one end to the other in Corinth. And here, in the middle of that place, is a church with disciples wondering, how do we live godly lives in an ungodly world? And so the pastor in me looks at Corinth and what the church is dealing with in Corinth and goes, yuck. But I wonder. I wonder how many people in that church struggled with all that yuckiness outside and inside. And I wonder if they wondered if the church was really different. I wonder, I wonder how many people in that church didn't really care, or maybe they didn't know any better. I, I wonder how many people really wanted to make a gospel impact but didn't know how. I wonder how they saw themselves. Did they think highly of who they were based on what they knew or what they had accomplished? And I think so. It's in the text. Or did some people struggle with an unhealthy self-worth of because, because of who they used to be and the things that they used to do and the things that they struggle with, present tense. I wonder in this church who felt hopeless, who felt stuck in sin, who felt like they were yucky because they too have been part of the yuck in Corinth or Lakewood. Who in that church couldn't shake the guilt that their yuckiness brought on? Who in that church got so caught up in the yuck that they forgot what God did and then they forgot who they were and then they forgot all hope? Anyone? I have some questions here. Does anyone here struggle with shame because of something you regret? Anyone define who you are according to what you struggle with? Are you, no, are, you, are you no better than your last mess up? Is there any, anyone listening today who, who goes back to the same sin over and over and over, and then you feel bad about it, and then it happens again, and you feel worse than before, and it happens again and again and again, and now you're convinced that God is just burning mad at you or at best tolerates you? Anyone? Anyone take an inventory and go, Golly, I'm a terrible Christian. Anyone here avoid church because you feel like you don't deserve to be here? Anyone here who comes for an hour and then you go back to your car and then you're like, oh, fool them again. Is there anyone here who just wants to feel okay and know that you matter and that you've got something to offer? If I've spoken to anybody here, listen, 1 Corinthians has a good word for you. With all of that yuck going on in the culture, seeping into the church, Paul had every right to begin his letter with something like this. Listen. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to the filthy Christians, if you can be called Christians at all, 
who are an, an embarrassment to Jesus Christ and who are supposed to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who are doing better than you are, who call on the name of Jesus our Lord, their Lord and ours, but mostly theirs because they're better, condemnation and scorn to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have been an appropriate opening. Everything Paul knows through oral reports, letters, living in Corinth, he knows the yuck, he knows the church is deep in it and dealing with it, but he can't help but give the church the very medicine that it needs, a word on what God has done, who they are, and what they have to hope for. You see, Paul goes on to correct the church, but before there's any correction, Paul starts with grace. So let's get into the real text. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Now this is important here. We want qualifications, right? If you're going to speak authoritatively, we need to know where you're coming from. If you're going to operate on a body, I got to know that you're qualified to operate on a body. I want to see your medical school diploma on the wall. I want to know that you're board certified, and then you can do what you're here to do, right? You see, Paul has been called. He makes it known. He's been called, not by his own appointment, but by the church, by the will of God. Paul has been called not by his appointment or by the church, but by the will of God. And it's important that Paul establish what he's about to say. And if he's going to correct the church, it's according to God's authority, not Paul's. This is equally important to, for us today as well. So you see, if it's me preaching... If it's Pastor James who's preaching, who's not here today because he's not feeling very well, so we'll keep him in our prayers. If it's Pastor Bill preaching, he's not here today because he's preaching in Tonino. But if it's any one of us preaching, you ought to know that we don't preach with our opinions. We don't lead with our opinions. We don't lead with how we feel about things because the way I think about something or the way I feel about something does not have the power to sustain you or give you hope or change. It's my wisdom. And the last thing you need here is my flawed wisdom. So we don't preach according to our authority. My opinions won't inspire hope in you. My correction, it's most likely going to make things worse. I see this play out in real time at home. <laughs> Trust me, right? So what you and I both need isn't what Pastor James or Pastor Bill or what I think. What we all need is a weekly reminder, reminder to stand under the authority of God's word. That's where hope and transformation happens, is when we stand under the authority of God's word. You cannot look to the wisdom of this world to give you what can only be found in Christ. That's why we submit to God's word. Now listen to Paul, now listen to what Paul says next, and, and pay attention, pay attention if you need a good word today, pay attention. To the church of God in Corinth. To the church of God. Those guys. That yucky, dysfunctional church. They belong to God. And so do you. Regardless of their yuckiness, they still belong to God. Regardless of our yuckiness, we still belong to God. To the church of God in Corinth, to those, oh, I love this, sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. To those sanctified. We're going to stop here for a second. Full stop. Did you notice something about sanctified? I love this. Past tense. To those sanctified. Sanctified is in the past tense here. You know what that means? It's already happened. Sanctification is the process where we become holy, right? But it's happened here. To those sanctified. It's already happened. Past tense. God has already changed their status from sinner to saint despite their present sins. Past tense. 
So is there anyone listening who goes back to the same sin over and over again and you feel bad about it and then it happens again and then you feel worse and then it happens again and now you're convinced that God is burning mad at you or at best tolerates you? Anybody in here going, gosh, I wish I could be a better Christian. I've got good news for you. If Jesus is your Lord, you are sanctified. It's happened. Past tense. You have been declared holy. And we, Paul writes, who have been sanctified are called to be his holy people. You see, holy and saint, it's the same word in the Greek. Sanctified and, and holiness. It's the same word in the Greek. If you are a saint, you're holy. If you're holy, you're a saint. And it doesn't happen outside of Jesus Christ. I love how the ESV, the English Standard Version, uh, translates this. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Holy and saint there. It's the same thing. So I'm talking to, I'm talking to deeply flawed Christians here. right? So if you're good the way you are and you have no regrets, I don't know how this preaches to you, but to my people... My kind of people, Corinthian sinners, accomplished sinners, to the people who carry regrets, losers, people who, who struggle with sin, to the bad Christians, my kind of people, to my people who look at other Christians and go, one day I'll be as holy as her. One day I'll be ho as holy as him. Why can't I be better? Listen, listen, sanctified past tense. You have been made holy. It's done. The work is done. You have been made holy. You have been set apart by who? By God. Holiness is in the past tense. It already happened. And it doesn't depend on us, but what Jesus has already done. It's a process for sure, but our status is locked in. You're holy. Get used to it. Your status has changed. Your failures can't erase it. Your accomplishments can't add to it. Your failures can't erase it. Your accomplishments can't add to it. And Paul continues, together with all who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, here's what he writes. To all these folks struggling with their yuckiness, folks who have had their status changed from sinner to saint because of Jesus, he says to them, grace and peace. That's an opener. Here's what the Word of God says to a church struggling to live a godly life in a godless world. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to them? Grace and peace to us? Yes. Absolutely. Because you are called, set apart, and declared holy by God. That's why. That's the gospel, isn't it? God giving his grace to sinners like us. And when sinners receive God's saving grace, their status changes from sinners in God's eyes to saints. Sinners to saints. So this is what I want you to say today. I want you to say, I'm a saint. Go ahead, say it. I'm a saint. Say it again. I'm a saint. You see, we struggle with this because the Catholic Church has taken this word holy, has taken this word saint, and they put qualifications on it. I talked about this a few weeks ago. I think there's five or seven qualifications to be a saint. You have to perform a miracle. You have to live a life of martyrdom. You have to just be great. <laughs> there's several other things you have to do and then we revere these people and we say, wow, St. Francis, he loved animals. <laughs> wow, look at St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And, and then we look at what she's done and, and we go, that's what a saint is. But when you read Paul's letters to the church, when you read Paul's letters to people struggling with sin, and yuckiness. He addresses them as saints. And sometimes we let our baggage, sometimes we let the things that we do 
overshadow who we are in God's eyes. And we define ourselves by those things, by those regrets. And Paul is saying, stop. You're saints. Get used to it. Before we even move into a word of correction, you got to know who you are. you got to know what Jesus has done. you got to know who you are. You can't forget that. You forget those things. You lose all hope. Saints, grace and peace to you. This means, because sanctification is in the past tense, this means that our past has been covered. And we need this reminder, right? We are no longer who we were. We're no longer what we've done. We are saints now. You are holy now. Get used to it. Our past has been covered. Because our past has been covered, our present is loaded with purpose. Here's what Paul writes. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Our present is loaded with purpose. You see, they have everything that they need. It's right there. Paul's confirming that. You guys got everything you need. God has covered their past, God has assured their present, and God has secured their future. I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's what he's saying before he even offers a word of correction. Church, we can't forget some things. Look what lies before you. Because of that, look what lies before you. Look at your future. Christ will sustain every one of us until the end. To you, whose future is immediately tied to your present. So to the people who have to maintain their status for value, who have to maintain your status for a comfortable future, listen. To my friends who have to keep this life up. To my folks who insist on faking it until they make it. Stop. Your eternal future is secure. It's done. Locked in. Guaranteed. Insured at the cross. Proven at the resurrection. You are holy. Locked in. And that guarantees a future that can never be taken from you. To the people who have no status, to my friends who have nothing to keep up, to my folks who can't even fake it, stop. Your eternal future is secure. It's done. Locked in guaranteed and shirt at the cross, proven at the resurrection, you are holy. You see, God's grace has covered our past. It has assured our present. It has secured our future. Knowing that, coming to grips with that, ought to shape how we live godly lives in an ungodly world. Amen? Join me in a word of prayer. Lord, that we would take this to heart and receive this title that you have given us, God, saying you call us holy, not because of what we do or what we've done or what we've left undone, all because of what you have done, Jesus. We thank you so much. Forgive us for those times when we define ourselves by lesser things, when we define ourselves by lesser actions. God, we need a word today. we got to be reminded who you are and what you've done, and because of who you are and what you've done, that sets who we are. And so, God, give us that reminder today. Now, friends, if there are any of you in here, and I don't want to assume that everybody in here is a Christ-professing Christian, but if there are any of you in here today who have not received Jesus as your Lord, today is your day. You know what God has done through his word. You know who we are now in his sight. You know what future lies ahead of you. So if you've never taken a moment to receive Jesus as your Lord, today's your day. The way we do this, it really comes down to control. Are you willing to give control of your life over to Jesus? Are you willing to say, okay, Jesus, 
I recognize I'm a sinner, and I recognize that you came to save sinners, and so I trust you. That's what that does. And if you're willing to do that today, pray something like this. Jesus, I receive you as Lord of my life. I receive you as Savior and Redeemer. I trust that you are who you say you are. And I surrender my life to you. If you said something like that today, welcome home. An immediate status change has just taken place. If you said something like that or you prayed something like that today, let us know. You don't have to come running up, up to the front. You don't have to raise your hand. Let me know because you belong to the church and we do this together and your journey has just begun. Welcome home. To the rest of us, Lord, will you recalibrate us today? May our worship be good and pleasing to you, Father. Help us live godly lives in an ungodly world. And the way we do that is by recognizing who you are and who we are. So thank you, God, for your word. Help us. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, 